Um, I thought it would be fun to talk to you all from down here so that you can see a little bit behind the scenes of what we've got. Um, tonight's cocktail is meant to connect with the miniature paintings that I'll be sharing with you. I thought it would be fun to share what might have been enjoyed during the era in which the miniature paintings come from, and perhaps something that the people who are depicted had. According to my research, uh, Stone Fence would have been a beverage of the late 18th and early 19th centuries. As you, so I have my, mine's a mocktail, but cheers everyone. So as you know, treasures abound in collection storages. And as a history museum, we find ourselves in possession of many personal items that once belonged to people of our community. Um, our job is not only to care for them, but also to tell their story where we can. What we like, uh, our collection is very diverse. We have uh, early, ninth, or early 20th century horse-drawn hearse. We have uh, personal effects and ephemera from the Earl family here from Greenville. We have uh, high school memorabilia. We have costumes uh, from the early 20th century to 1970. We have military uniforms. We have uh, images from Camp Sevier and just a smattering of things. So it's exciting to be able to be a part of the collection and to learn more about it. And when I was invited to be a part of this program, I thought this was the perfect opportunity to be able to learn more about these miniatures, set of miniatures that I uh, have been curious about since I started and joined the UHM team. I really wanted to know why French miniature portraits from the late, 19, late 18th and early 19th century were part of the collection and what they had in common with the upcountry of South Carolina. I didn't realize that it would take me on kind of a fun genealogical adventure to learn more about the people and why they are part of our collection. Um, so I do have the miniatures to show you live at the moment, but then I will switch to a uh, PowerPoint slide so that you all can see them more detailed and without the reflections of the lighting on the glass and things. So um, this is the oldest one we have in the collection. Sorry, it looks kind of blurry. I apologize for that. Um, has this one. And then we've got two young women, too. All right, so now I'll switch to the PowerPoint. We'll make it easier for you all to see. There we go, much nicer. So here are the portraits once again for you to be able to see in a little better detail. Um, they are all members of one family um, and the story begins with our donor, Marjorie Watson. And in 2002, before the museum had a phys physical location, Ms. Watson donated these five portraits. Um, she was a longtime resident of Greenville a retired Spanish professor from Furman, and a descendant of the people depicted here. Um, along with the portraits, Ms. Watson also provided written histories from both her mother and her grandmother of their recollections of what the history related to the people in the miniatures were. Um, with these, I was able to start my journey along the genealogical path to find out more about the people in these uh, images. So just to begin, a uh, brief history of miniature portraits in general. They originated in the 16th century with the tradition of illuminated manuscripts. And during the 16th and 17th centuries, they served primarily as diplomatic gifts among the royalty and the elite. Uh, they were also exchanged as tokens during marriage negotiations or were created to commemorate significant life moments like births, deaths, 
or missed, uh, missed events. Early miniatures were painted with watercolor or gouache on vellum, and then ivory became popular, and eventually enamel as they grew in popularity. By the 18th century, uh, their popularity was widespread among those who could afford them. Of course, they were not something that everyone could afford. Um, with the advent of photography, however, the demand for miniature portraits diminished, although they did remain popular throughout the 19th century. Uh, the oldest portrait we have is of uh, Jean-Marie Etiennette Borel. It's from 1782, and it depicts her at 26. Uh, this is the miniature we have the most information on. She um, was painted, or it's, a tr it's signed by the artist Perlet, and it's attributed to Pierre Perlet, a painter and engraver in Paris at the time. And um, in the side there, you can see someone at some point has put in a note that discusses her birth date, her death date, her marriage date, and how old she was in this portrait. It's in a leather case and it has um, uh, velvet and silk surrounding it. Um, according to the family history, Etiennette was born in Geneva, Switzerland to Protestant parents. And it also mentions that she had a brother, Antoine, who lived in Paris and also worked as an engraver and painter. Um, the the family history then notes that she married John Frontis, as noted here on the, the note, in 1786. So this is John Frontis. He is said to have been born in Nantes, France in 1760. Uh, his parents died when he was a child, and so he went to live with, according to the family lore, a not-so-nice Catholic aunt. And he was trained as a tailor and traveled throughout France eventually making his way to Port-au-Prince, Santo Domingo, where he's described as a successful merchant trader. It is in Port-au-Prince that he and Etienne marry. And I've yet to find records that shed light on how Etienne found her way to Port-au-Prince, but I hope someday to be able to find those. Um, I'm interested to know, did she know John before he left France? Or, um, and was the port, was the miniature, was this miniature something that she had given him in exchange for, um, as part of the marriage negotiations, as a romantic gesture so that he wouldn't forget her? Or did she somehow find her way to Port au Prince? Um, I'm not sure what would have taken her there, but did they meet there? So I'm hoping that someday we'll be able to find those, uh, those facts. Um, so John and Etienne married in 1786, and they continued to be prosperous in Santo Domingo. He acquired land and other businesses uh, until the uprising of 1791. In 1792, they, along with their three children, two daughters, Ephrosine and Elizabeth, and their son, Stephen, returned to France, having lost just about everything that they had. They settled in Cognac for a short period, but in April of 1793, John decided to uh, immigrate to Philadelphia and reestablish his merchant trader business. He left Etienne and the children in France, however, and according to the written history, she returned to Geneva, Switzerland, to be near her family and uh, have additional support from, from his absence. Um, according to the story that is provided by Ms. Watson, he did not see his family again until 1800. And these are the children, uh, Ephrosine and Elizabeth. And I speculate that since these portraits are, um, according to our uh, appraisal documents, circa 1805, I'm wondering if maybe these, along with the other two, uh, were made for John, being that he wasn't with them all the time. So these portraits are painted on board and they are in, encased in little brass uh, pendants so that they could be worn by loved ones. The family history also noted that it thought that they had been done by Etiennette's brother Antoine but there's no uh, indication of who the artist was at this time. Um, the backs also 
show a tradition that was very popular at the time in that they are um, on the backside have plated hair. So hair art at the time flourished in the Victorian area, era where locks of hair were often exchanged as keepsakes, as tokens of affection or remembrances. If a friend was moving away and they didn't think that they would see each other again, they would often share locks of hair. And many times it was done in this way where it was braided or it was turned into some form of art. Sometimes it was put into a locket or a ring or um, made into a brooch. So I thought it was very interesting that these have the hair, and my presumption is that um, it is the hair of each of the individuals, or at least all of the ladies, um, in the portrayed in the portraits. And while um, hair art is not popular today, it does continue to be an art form today. So I thought it would be fun to show the portrait, the earliest portrait that we have of Etienne where she's aged 26 and then circa 1805, which presumably she would have been 49. And it seems that life has been rather challenging. Um, I would not have guessed that that woman was 49 in that portrait, but uh, you can see the similarities in the jaw and the eyes uh, as well. So unfortunately, so these are the, the five that we have of the family members. And that still didn't really answer my question of why are they here? But then the linchpin of all of the story is their son, Stephen. And unfortunately, while we don't have an image of him, he uh, has a, a very detailed history available to learn about. Um, he, along with his, as I mentioned, along with his mother and sisters lived in Switzerland while their father lived in Philadelphia. And as a young man, he was trained as a cabinet maker. In 1809, he decided to join his father in Philadelphia to avoid conscription into Napoleon's army. Um, as a trained cabinet maker, when he arrived in Philadelphia, he was able to make a living. Although in 1813, he became involved in the Presbyterian Church, which changed his path life forever, his life path forever, excuse me. Um, in 1817, he was invited to teach French at the Female Academy in Raleigh, North Carolina. And in 1820, he joined the Theological Seminary in Princeton and graduated in 1823. From there, he did missionary work in Maryland, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and graduated in 1823. I'm sorry, he, Pennsylvania and Delaware. In, ninth, in 1839, he was ordained and was a pastor of Salisbury Church until 1846. Records indicate that his sisters, Elizabeth and Ephrosine, became members of the church during his tenure. It's not known when they came to live with Stephen, but neither of them ever married, and it does appear that they lived with him for the remainder of their lives. And actually, one of them outlived him. Um, he continued to uh, have live a pastoral life. He acted as a pastor in Iredell County, North Carolina, and he played a pivotal role in the creation of Davidson College, where he eventually taught from 1856 until his death in 1867. Um, with his second wife, Rachel Beatty, he had a son, David Beatty Frontis, who would go on to become a dedicated doctor where he practiced medicine first in North Carolina. And then in an effort to ease the symptoms of his wife's uh, bouts with malaria, they moved to Johnston, South Carolina. And apparently he was such a well-renowned and loved doctor, the community of um, Ridge Spring, South Carolina, asked him to come be their physician. And he and his wife, Anna, lived in Ridge Spring for the remainder of their lives and took care of that community. They had a daughter, Ruby, who then married uh, Manchester Watson, who were the parents of Marjorie Watson. So with that, we have now come full circle and seen the connections between these French 18th and 19th century portraits and how they found their way into the collection of the Upcountry History Museum in South Carolina. Um, it's 
I thought it was fun and very exciting to be able to learn more about these people and to learn more about who they were and why they were here and how they got here. Um, and while there are still many unanswered questions, I was able to learn a bit more about these individuals. And of course, I'm still trying to learn as much as I can about them. Um, there's uh, Stephen Francis wrote a autobiography that is in a library in a university in North Carolina that someday would be lovely to be able to see and read and hear his account of his life story and maybe fill in some of those details that we haven't yet been able to fill in. Um, I am excited to be able to know these individuals and be able to share more about their lives and share that with visitors and others so that it's no longer uh, just a miniature sitting in a case for someone to look at, but that it has a life behind it. And I personally feel like when you hear the story of objects, that it does bring them uh, to life in general and that it makes history more approachable and, and more connected to you as an individual. So um, I hope that you have enjoyed my talk. Apparently I talked a little faster than I had anticipated. So we do have plenty of time for questions. I apologize for that. But um, I also thought it would be fun to show you um, the, the family tree that I've been able to put together thus far just by following the nuggets of the family history and the other um, elements that people have put out there uh, based on their lives. All right, we're ready for some questions. Um, let's see. So one of our members has asked, how much would one of these paintings have cost in today's money, you know, relatively? And how long would the artist need to complete the painting? Um, well, I know the, some of the research that I have seen miniatures in today's art market um, go for a few hundred dollars to tens of thousands of dollars, depending on who painted them. I know in, in the era that many of them were popular, some very well-known painters painted them as a way to pay the bills if they didn't have large commissions at the time because uh, they were uh, easily done. And I don't believe they took very long to do um, simply because they're pretty tiny in size. So. And um, is there any signification that they were painted on board or were they all typically painted on board? Typically, you know, I, the ones that were painted on board, I think is a bit, is somewhat unusual in that it became very popular to paint them on ivory or enamel. And part of that was because on ivory, it illuminated the color much more prominently than when they were painting them on vellum. Um, these were a little later. And so it could be that it was, if it really was their brother that did them or her brother that did them, it's perhaps he just did them as a, favor to them um, but they were done on different types of materials and at the time enamel was most popular but these are clearly on a type of board okay and um, how did you trace this information uh, regarding the family um, are they were they well known um, and where did um, did he practice um, well it started with um, I'll show you. So these are the types of things that sometimes come with uh, artifacts. So this is one of the accounts of Ms. Watson. I think this is her grandmother's account. And so it's, you know, handwritten on a piece of paper in pencil. And so what I did was I took some of the information that both she and Ms. Watson's mother provided as far as dates and names and locations. And I really did kind of go to genealogical sites and see if I could find um, some things that would then lead me to the next nugget of information. Um, Stephen Francis is actually a very prominent Presbyterian minister. So there was a site um, at the North Carolina Council of Presbyterian, uh, I think that's what it is. Um, actually, it's the NCPedia 
I found a brief history of Stephen Prontis, but then also gave me more information to uh, track him and find his story and, and things like that. And um, was it typical for the subjects of these paintings to hold something meaningful to them as the couple were? I, I yes, I believe so. Um, like she's holding a letter and he's holding a book, so those would have been um, symbolic to the two of them. Maybe it was that they had written correspondence and, and things like that. Um, it's usually some sort of connection to them, yes. Okay, and um, one of our members has asked, um, not necessarily related to th this particular collection you're talking about, but that she saw a lovely collection of miniatures at the History Museum in Charleston. And do you have any knowledge of that? Is it a permanent part of their collection? Um, or I don't honestly know about that collection. And, and these that you've shown us today, they're a permanent part of the Upcountry History Museum collection? Yes, they were part of our permanent collection. May I answer that question? Uh, absolutely, if you have the answer. <laughs> I have, have first-hand information. This is Martha Severins. I was for 11 years the curator at the Gibbs Museum of Art, which has a distinguished collection of miniatures, uh, like 400. Oh. And um, I've done a lot of research with the miniatures, and I want to commend you for how you've handled these um, treasures at the Um Country History Museum. So it's the Gibbs Museum of Art with its miniature collection. Uh, the question about how much did people pay for miniatures? Uh, one of the local artists in Charleston by the name of Charles Frazier, uh, we're very lucky to have his account book and he would sometimes charge uh, $35 or $50 uh, for people who sat for his portraits. And now, this was between 1817 and about 1845. So you have to kind of translate how much money that might have been. And he worked uh, almost exclusively in terms of watercolor and ivory, very different from the uh, ones here at the History Museum, which are very typically French with that opaque background. And of course, the two young girls with their very Empire style um, clothing. Um, the, I think the dating of about 1805 is, is about right in terms of the Napoleonic uh, period. So. I, I think I was dubious, to be perfectly honest, why were they there? Why are they here? Um, but I think you've done a good job um, justifying um, th that they, there is legacy um, that goes way back and you've done good research. So thank you. All right, any other questions from anyone? Well, I think this was wonderful. Thank you so much, Christina. We've really enjoyed, uh, this is, and not a particular type of artwork that I've had any experience viewing. So this was really wonderful. Thank you. Yes, and and yes, the the I I did sort of mention that of today's value, but these were usually um, commissioned by royalty or elite, so they were very expensive during the time that they were made as well. All right. Well. Um, I think we'll close for today, but um, this was wonderful. And if um, you want, feel free to share this link um, to Christina's talk with anyone that you know that's not a member of OLLI. Um, we want this to, to reach as broad an audience as we can. It will be up on the YouTube channel later this evening. Thank you. So, and I hope everyone has you. the opportunity to thank you. see the museum someday. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you, Christina. Thank you. That was great, Christina. Thank you. <gasps> Public speaking is makes me nervous. So <laughs> you did a good job. You did you wonderfully. If you can hear me, this is Judy Aiton. Hi, hi. Hello. Do you still have that hearse in the basement? Yes, we do. All right. <laughs> <laughs> just waiting for the right opportunity to bring it up. It needs some conservation, so someday we'll be able to have it go to conservation and then we'll have to show it off in all its 
wonderful, creepy glory. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> I was not no. familiar with that little tidbit. <laughs> you yeah. made it out before Halloween. I know, I know. But like I said, it, it does, it's from about 1911 and it was horse drawn. And so it does need quite a bit of TLC, but it is a fun uh, fixture of the basement in, in our collection storage. So. Well, we miss hanging out at the museum. Gary says hi. Hello. Uh, we miss you guys uh, too. <laughs> we, we look forward to when we can gather in larger groups and, and have more of our normal programming. Yeah, that'll be good. Bye bye. I back into the museum, you know, during this time where we're not all able to get out and, and see it in person. Yeah, yeah. Although, you know, we are open and, and we do, we, we have visitors that are uh, following all the guidelines and, and enjoying their visits socially distanced. So. Good to know for our people. All right. Well, everybody have a wonderful evening and finish up those yummy cocktails and, uh, and come back next week. Thanks Thank so much. much. Great to see everybody. Have a great weekend.